Many of us may be completely unaware we have Neanderthal DNA, but a strange reminder has come in the form of COVID-19. Neanderthal genes are linked to how ill people get with the coronavirus. That's what scientists are saying. Modern humans and Neanderthals split hundreds of thousands of years ago, but their genetic remnants are still with many of us today. It's thought some of the genes help them fight infection. But today, it may be a different story. Let's look at the mysterious world of some of our ancestors and the coronavirus. A good topic for a Friday. See any similarities? Well, my back's not that hairy. But on a serious note, researchers from the Max Planck Institute suggest that one single chromosome doubles the risk of getting severely ill, and we can blame the prehistoric Neanderthals for that. Those with copies of the chromosome from both parents could face an even higher risk. This sequence of genes is more common in people from some regions of the world than others. If you're of South Asian descent, you've got a much higher chance of carrying this ancient gene. From Africa, your chances are lower. It appears Neanderthals never lived on the continent. It's not all bad news, though. Researchers say that the Neanderthal genes can also carry benefits when it comes to COVID. Well, we have the pleasure to have Ugo Tiebeck on the line. He discovered the link and is a medical doctor and works for Germany's Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, as well as the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. So tell us, how did you actually manage to discover this? So in the, I'm a part of a big collaboration of scientists across the globe. Uh, and we try to find the gene variants that people have that get really sick in COVID-19. And uh, I've also been working with the Neanderthal genome for the last couple of years. And we discovered one big genetic risk factor for COVID-19. And I decided to compare it to the Neanderthal genome. And to my big surprise, it was a perfect match to the Neanderthal genome. What made you think to compare the two? It just popped up in my head. It was one of those occasions where you just stumble upon something. It was, uh, it was a big surprise. So what's this genetic link with the Neanderthals actually mean for us? It means that for at least this disease, um, the interbreeding with Neanderthals had tragic consequences. Uh, a lot of people have been hospitalized and even died due to this genetic variant. But there's also an upside to this, I believe. Not, not only does it mean for some people that uh, COVID is more severe, uh, there's also a positive to this, I believe. Is that right? Yes, yes, you're absolutely correct. So we, we later discovered a second variant that actually protects against COVID-19. It does not protect as good as the, uh, the bad one increases the risk, but we actually have two variants from, from Neanderthals that influence the outcome of COVID-19. And why is that? Why are there two very different opposing variants? Perhaps it's not such a big surprise that you would find uh, both positive and negative variants. So approximately half of the Neanderthal genome is scattered uh, among people of, with roots out of, outside of Africa. But it is surprising that we have two variants influencing COVID-19. How many people are we actually talking about who have this gene and, and, and where in the world? So for the, the bad variant, the risk variant, 16% in, in Europe, so one in six would carry this variant. And in South Asia, approximately half of the, of the people carry this variant. And this is unusually much for being a Neanderthal variant. It is missing in Africa and it's, it's missing in East Asia. The good variant, on the other hand, is present approximately a, a third of people outside, uh, outside Africa. Okay, so does this explain why we've seen uh, such a different reaction in different parts of the world. I mean, Africa, for example, was so untouched early on in, in this pandemic. Yes, I think this plays a role. I think genetics plays a role. We should remember that there are other important risk factors, age being the most important risk factor, and many countries have younger demographics than in Europe. But I do think genetics plays a role in this. So. Just explain to me and, and our viewers how your research could be useful in fighting this pandemic and also in the future, in future pandemics. So I think this can be used in at least two ways. So one way would be to identify people at risk. 
and this is very important. Uh, it might also tell us something about the disease, and that's important for future drug development. So I, I think we can use this information in, in many ways. Does it uh, make you feel a bit more positive about how we're tackling this whole pandemic? I think one should be very humble and, and happy to see this collaboration among scientists. A lot of us have shifted focus go, going into a direction direction around COVID. And I think that is very encouraging. Ugo Tiebeck, thank you very much for being on the show today. A pleasure to have you along. He works for Germany's Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, as well as the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Thank you. The World Health Organization says there's no reason to stop using the AstraZeneca vaccine. Thailand and Bulgaria added to the list of countries delaying the rollout on Friday over suspicion of severe side effects in a tiny minority of cases. Denmark was among the first to announce a delay after reports of severe blood clots. No definitive link between the jab and the clots has yet been proven, but the European Medicines Agency said it will continue to monitor the use of the vaccine closely. Pippa Stevens joins us from our science desk to tell us more about this very complicated story. Um, can you just break it down for our viewers, first of all? It is, isn't it? So one batch of the AstraZeneca vaccine is being investigated by the European Health Authority. Um, now, it cites one death in Denmark for somebody who had the vaccine um, and a very small number of cases of blood clots um, as well of people who've had the vaccine. Now, we're talking very small numbers, so 30 cases out of 5 million people who have been vaccinated in Europe. So does that mean people shouldn't be worried about taking the AstraZeneca jab? I mean, there are a lot of people around the world who are getting it right now. Yeah, look, I mean, my mum had the jab, so like everyone, I'm going to be watching the news huh. on this. Um, but we really have to think about link, uh, links here. You know, there is not a link proved. Um, and the UK has given the jab to 11 million people and it's not, it's not planning on pulling it. Um, and it says that that's, that's just what we'd expect naturally occurring in the population anyway. You know, when you vaccinate millions and millions of people, statistically, those people are just going to have things that would be occurring anyway in the general population. That's why we have health authorities to look into this for us. So tell us, what's AstraZeneca saying? So it's, it's saying that it's looked at the safety extensively in clinical trials of the vaccine. It's also published its research in peer-reviewed journals, which is the gold standard in science. Um, one more thing I would add is that the EMA hasn't advised countries should pause on the vaccine, on the AstraZeneca vaccine. OK, so it's a country-by-country country choice in this yeah. case. Yeah. Pippa Stevens, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Derek Williams, turn now to answer your questions on the coronavirus. Keep sending them in. Just leave a message on our YouTube channel. How did the Spanish flu pandemic end, even without treatment or a vaccine? The influenza pandemic that began hammering the world in 1918 is, is thought to have infected around a third of the global population in the space of a couple of years. Um, though it's impossible to pin down exact numbers, most calculations estimate it claimed between 50 and 100 million victims. Now that's as many or more as those later killed in the Second World War. Um, then, by 1920, the Spanish flu seemed to fade away. The pandemic just trailed off and, and, and nobody at the time could really explain why. Um, epidemiologists and historians now believe the beginning of the end of the flu pandemic occurred then because in the absence of a vaccine, that's how long it took to achieve a measure of global herd protection through infection. Um, but it came at a horrendous price. A, a disease killing the same percentage of people today would take hundreds of millions of lives. An interesting aspect of this historical narrative is that experts say even though the pandemic ended in the early 1920s, the virus that caused it didn't disappear. Um, instead, it looks like immunity and large parts of the population drove it to mutate into a less virulent form. Um, in fact, researchers who've analyzed genomes of modern flu viruses have identified um, genetic traces linking them to the original 1918 virus, uh, which has been sequenced from century-old uh, lung samples. So, in a way, 
the pathogen that caused such devastation back then is still with us today. It's just evolved into less virulent forms that occasionally then evolve further back into deadlier variants and strains, though so far um, never as deadly as its ancestor. And, and many experts project something similar could occur with SARS-CoV-2. I was at this place behind me not that long ago and it looked very, very different with countries scrambling to administer the vaccine. Every possible space is being turned into a vaccination center. In the UK, even Westminster Abbey has become a kind of sacred walk-in clinic. This is the view ordinarily seen by millions of tourists a year, but this is something different entirely. The Royal Church at the heart of London is doing its bit as part of the vaccination drive. So Charles Dickens is buried just behind me. Uh, Geoffrey Chaucer is over there. As these people look down, just after they've been vaccinated, uh, they'll suddenly be able to go, oh, look, look who it is. <laughs> It's an example of the lengths the UK has gone to, and the success is showing. You'll let me know when it's in, won't you? All done. It's all done. There you go. Over a third of Brits have got their first jab far ahead of European neighbours. I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> it was extraordinary. And to, to do it here in Westminster Abbey, you know, the nation's great, great seat of coronations and goodness knows what else in the sight of Oscar Wilde and John Dryden and Robert Browning and Poets Corner. For Brits praying for lockdown to be over soon, they've certainly come to the right place. And for free. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and see you again soon.